appreciate all of our uh, audience, our listening and viewing audience uh, that's here and ready uh, to participate on this very important topic, very important issue that has literally plagued this city pre-Katrina, and we're seeing how it's uh, still here, live and well uh, in this post-Katrina environment, and that is slum property, in my opinion, properties that do not meet the minimum housing standards in which there are laws on the books that govern and should protect our citizens from having to live in these environments. And, um, and we all know the many different issues that impact our families who are subjected to living in, in these um, homes. It's even hard to call them a home because a home should be that of quality and one that we literally all deserve, no matter uh, your economic uh, status, race or ethnicity. So at this time, I'm going to call our panelists up to come to the dais that will lead us in this discussion. And I have Dr. George Holder, who is the Healthy Communities Portfolio Director uh, for the Louisiana Public Health Institute, uh, LPHI, that has been a real leader in this city uh, around many different um, health issues. It all relates to public health, in my opinion. We have Ms. Della Wright, who is the Evaluation Manager at the Institute for Women and Ethnic Studies. And we also have our own Ms. Trina Lackey, a resident of our great city of New Orleans. I want to just thank Ms. Trina for having the courage and the confidence to come forward and to speak on this issue because you have seen it and experienced it firsthand like many of our residents have and are experiencing right now. But many fear retribution from whether it's their landlord or their neighbors even, or even just government. It's just fearful. So I want to just thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here and being a voice for so many people, especially women and children in our city who are living in these environments. Now, I know that my other colleagues, those who will be participating, are coming down. Um, I do not want to, uh, it's almost 10 minutes after two, and I really like to stay on, um, on time and, and, you know, and on task. So if uh, it's okay with you, uh, I would like to call the meeting to order and we can begin our presentations. Is that okay with you? Okay. Uh, Mr. Nathan. Council, Council Member Cantrell, Chair present. Uh, we do not currently have a quorum, but this is an informational meeting. Thank you for that, Nathan. And we do not have any issues that we will be voting on, so information only is fine, because this is to inform the public, to inform the council uh, of steps that we need to take to improve the quality of life of housing and, of course, our people. Um, so let's, let's move forward. So, Doctor, do you want to start us off? Sure. Okay. Well, thank you to the committee for the time to present. And really this is so important. We need to hear everything you have to say. Okay, I'll do So let's that. bend that mic down. Okay. Does that work? Oh, Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you to the committee for the time to present on the relationship between housing and health, specifically as it relates to mothers and children. LPHI's mission is to improve health and quality of life for all. <clears throat> and as director of our Healthy Communities portfolio, I lead our work in addressing the social determinants of health. Now, as you know, there's only so much a healthcare provider can do in a hospital or within a doctor's office. In fact, things outside of healthcare settings are stronger determinants of health outcomes than access to and quality of care. That's why housing is an issue of high importance for us. <clears throat> Researchers have consistently linked quality of housing to health, and they've shown that this relationship is direct and indirect. On direct effects, take for example, the absence of working smoke detectors in homes. In the past few years, more than one home has burned down in the city and lives have been lost. 
As we've become more involved in the issue of housing, we've heard more and more horror stories from organizations that work directly with clients in substandard housing conditions. We've heard of families who have had untreated sewage leaking into their apartment from units above them and their daily fight to keep their children free from exposure to those pathogens. We also know far too many renters have to put buckets out when it rains because the water comes inside or runs down the wall. And I think we're all familiar with the kind of serious respiratory illness caused by mold and dampness. And when families live with insect or rodent infestations, they risk illness borne by those pests as well as aggravated asthma. These living situations can have lifelong effects for children, not to mention missed school days and serious costs to the healthcare system. Recent data show that New Orleans rental housing stock is rife with these health and safety issues. Nearly 2,000 units had mold, over 7,000 had signs of rodents, and per capita, New Orleans actually has the unfortunate designation of being the rattiest city in the country. Housing like this also has indirect effects on health and well-being, and recently these indirect effects have received quite a bit of media attention nationally due to the publication of research by Harvard sociologist Matthew Desmond. His research is specifically focused on female-headed households with children, and so it seems particularly appropriate to share it here after the Mother's Day holiday we celebrated just this last weekend. He shows that issues like substandard housing also put families at risk for eviction due to the frequent requests they have to make for repairs. And eviction creates incredible housing instability that is actually a cause of poverty and not just a condition of it. The health impacts of that instability include greater odds of depression, worse overall health <clears throat> for children in the home, as well as pro additional problems like the dissolution of relationships and moves to less safe communities. So I'm going to let our partners at IWES expand on those specific conditions, but I'll close by thanking the council for your previous attention to this issue and ask that you all consider how we can move our city forward in a way that ensures that mothers and children all have safe and healthy environments in which to live. Thank you so much, and let the record state that Councilman Williams and Councilwoman Guidry have joined uh, the committee at this time. Please proceed. Uh, thank you to the, to the committee for the opportunity and time to present on this very important issue. Uh, I'm Della Wright. I'm the Evaluation Manager at the Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies, or IWES. Uh, IWES is dedicated to improving the mental, physical, and spiritual health and quality of life for women and their families and communities of color, particularly among marginalized populations using community-driven research, programs, training, and advocacy. Uh, George did a really excellent job of painting the big picture for y'all, so I would like to share a little bit about IWES's most recent public awareness campaign. Uh, it's called In That Number, and it seeks to reveal the real stories of the young people and families behind some of the statistics that you might hear in the news. Uh, we designed the In That Number campaign to focus on sharing with the city how mental health symptoms affect the real lives of the vulnerable youth that we work with, as well as their families. The campaign strives to change negative perceptions of youth and advocate for the need for trauma-informed care services for them. Instead of viewing youth who have behavioral issues or who have gotten into trouble as being bad kids, this campaign challenges adults throughout the city to see them as possibly sad and in need of emotional health services. The stories that we share through the campaign also reveal many of the underlying social determinants of the mental health symptoms that these young people face, so really the conditions that cause or exacerbate their problems. Uh, there are 12 different stories on our website and they kind of run the gamut of experiences that young people in the city are having, but the one that I wanna share with you today is Kendall's, so this is his story. I moved with my parents and three siblings to New Orleans from the Midwest three years ago. I grew up in a really affluent town, so school was the most stressful thing going on in most kids' lives. That wasn't the case for me. I lived in 19 different houses growing up. For a while, it was like two houses per year, so moving around was pretty commonplace. One of the hardest parts was that I would come home from school some days and all my stuff would just be packed up. They'd be like, oh, we're moving, and there was no forewarning. It was stressful. I became more inward. I didn't talk to very many people, and I became a weird child. 
I was socially awkward and didn't know how to interact with people. I didn't want to talk about normal things that people talk about because it wasn't relevant to me and seemed stupid. It impacted my grades too. I never wanted to pay attention in school. When you're dealing with issues at home, you don't feel like certain things are important. So I felt that school didn't matter as much as the other things on my mind and I never paid attention. So Kendall's story is just one example of the incredible impact that housing instability and constant displacement have on young people. Over the past few years, we at IWES have conducted a survey with about 1,500 youth in the city about their experiences, exposures to violence, and their worries and sources of stress. We found the strong correlations that you might expect between exposure to violence and mental health symptoms, but it also showed that young people who worried about basic necessities, like access to food and housing, were three times more likely to report depression, PTSD, and suicidal ideation, or thinking about committing suicide. Housing instability and displacement occur for a variety of reasons but we certainly know from our work that many New Orleanians are more susceptible to it because of our aging and substandard housing stock. George shared some of the statistics, and I'll just add that we have in New Orleans more than 2,000 units without a working bathroom, 5,000 plus units with water leaks from the outside, and 5,500 units without a working smoke detector. We know that living or being forced to move from homes that are unsafe and unhealthy can contribute to the undue stress that children in this city are experiencing. So in light of this Mother's Day, we really thank you for your leadership as a council on this issue and ask that you continue your work to ensure that mothers don't have to worry about their children experiencing symptoms of depression and PTSD because of living in unsafe or unhealthy homes. Thank you. Ms. Trina. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you for having me here this afternoon. My husband and I would like to thank you, but we, um, when we reflect back on where we lived on, in New Orleans East on Bundy Road off of Morrison, we had a, a landlord who was considered a slumlord. Mr. Tom Nugent, he allowed us to live in this place for three and a half years where there was leakage all over. We had up and down um, stairs and there was leakage from the ceiling to the appliances from the neighbor's washer on um, through the walls and under the kitchen zinc especially you could just see the mold smell the mold I got sick from the mold suffering from respiratory problems sleepless nights um, it would interfere with my husband and I it was depression, it was um, PTSD, it was a lot of stuff, and my, my son as well. Um, it was just, and then when we, tr when we asked him to try to make the necessary repairs, he refused letters and meetings and phone calls from uh, FHA. So that just showed us that he didn't care about us one way or the other. He just really wanted to receive his, his, his rent. And, and at one time, he, of, of all people, decided, well, maybe I just need to evict y'all. But we didn't have a place to live. But thank God now we are buying our home. Um, it, was just, it was just terrible. And I don't wish that upon anybody. And being a New Orleanian, loving it here, that was just like a nightmare on Bundy Road. Seems fitting, huh? Now, I know that we have um, council members that would like to speak on the issue, but I would like to go to public comment, if you don't mind, and we can get it all and just, okay. So um, there's agreement here, consensus. Uh, so we will, uh, if you don't have anything else to add right now, let's hear from the public and we can debrief and move forward through the committee. Now, I have, now this is in cursive and I really cannot make it out. Uh, Aquin. <clears throat> now I'm the worst with names, so if my colleague is saying he can't, then it has to be. ACQ. ACQ. WA. You know, it's you come on and let us. And I know who you are now that I'm seeing your wonderful face. Come on here, it's good to see you. And 
Yes, and, and say your name for us on the record. Dr. Wanetta Barnes. That's 20, it. 2325 Daniel Street, and I write like a doctor. Yes. What, I was, what I'm uh, 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 want to say about, okay, I'm a rural home small rental, and the thing about, too, why there's blighted property or uh, increased blighted property, because they allow rural home small rental to leave here without properly fixing the property like they promised. Now, Roll Home had a building in Baton Rouge that was high as an old tree. Now, you know they brought that with small rental money, and they probably sold that. Where did that money go? They promised me $300,000 to renovate my property. My property was lived in and was cared for prior to Katrina. Okay, right now they have no one in my property because I'm still trying to get repaired. They promised $300,000. Where did that money go? Also, as well, and they're causing more blight to your property, especially if you have a little roof damage. A small damage can cause a big problem. Also, uh, I want to reverse mortgage. I try to do reverse mortgage to offset it. And this needs to be investigated too. FHA and HARD has a plan to hold you back. I went to do reverse mortgage. Downstairs has been gutted out, you know. So when I went to do reverse mortgage, I complied with the reverse mortgage, but they told me too much of my property need to repair. Only 15, they're making up all these laws to hold you back and keep you from repairing your property. As they say, I need, my property needs too much to be repaired, and only 15%. I said, well, that's a roof, a half a roof. What that is? I say, but I could buy drugs, I could gamble, I, I could give money to North Korea, South Korea, ISIS, I could make somebody else rich, I could buy another piece of damaged property and renovate, I could give it away, but I can't repair my property. And this is the problem we have with reverse mortgage. Another thing, the man up there in, uh, who gets permit, was withholding re permit and was refusing to give me permit. Okay, they had contractor fraud, and it's kicked because the rural home is divided into three sections. The, the small renter, the, the, I mean the, the, the homeowners, the small rental, which I am a homeowner because I live in one of my properties, and the investment property. All right, now they gave the people who had contracted fraud money back, okay? But the fact that when we went to get our money back, they told us we didn't qualify because that wasn't, that would have helped as well because we didn't qualify for that, for that program. It doesn't make any sense. Well, when they gonna give us our money back for contractor fraud too? Everything is coming down here for the single family home. But none's coming down here for small rental property and, and rental property. Thank and you, Ms. Sacramento. Airbnb. I could Airbnb my own property. Not only that, but I complain about the guy behind me whose property is leaning on me. Call enforcement service another property. problem. They're stealing people's property. They know a lot of people are still waiting on their money. The fact of man, they're talking about 10 years. What took you so long? Right. Um, you know, Thank you so much. Right, statute of limitation is the most discriminated law there is. What took them 10 years to renovate our property? And the guy behind me, why didn't I do nothing about him? He's leaning on my property. Right. Even if I repair, I still can let nobody. 2009, 20, what that's 2009, 2007, First Street. They haven't done nothing about him. So calling the first postal service needs to be investigated. It's a lot of things that need to be considered. Yes, ma'am. Well. Thank and you then, so much for you your all comments. Put, then the city put people in sub, substandard living too as well. That's true. Thank you, Ms. Aquanetta. And she makes a really, really good point that is factual. The bottom line is, is that the resources that were funneled through the state to help homeowners as well as rental property owners. The majority of the resources did go to homeowners of occupied properties. Although New Orleans has been a city with majority rental properties, and based on that formula, the majority of the resources should have gone to help rental property owners. And that just did not happen. And also, the small rental program helped very few, and it never fully got off the ground. And that is just a fact, and as a result of that, it has contributed to the many blighted properties that we have in the city, but also those that could not be renovated to meet the minimum housing standards. You kind of have to call it what it is. And, uh, and, and it's in black and white, and it is true. 
that the majority of those resources did not go to the renters nor the rental property owners to provide quality housing for our rental community. The next we have is Rose Murray, followed by Quinn Griffin and Breon De Decker. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here and holding this information session on this really important issue. My name is Rose Murray. Um, I have lived in dozens of ap rental apartments in New Orleans over the last um, seven years. Uh, I am an attorney practicing in the city. Um, and I'll just start by going through, well, I'll, I, can, I can relay my own stories of apartments that I've lived in, but uh, I also end up helping a lot of friends, friends of friends. Um, I had the opportunity to do a legal internship at the housing unit of legal aid, and so I've heard a lot of tenant stories and have to say, um, being that I was a law student and later an attorney, fortunately I did have access to um, information and knowledge that helped me advocate for myself and the tenants who, who end up coming to me for help. But um, the experiences of people who don't uh, have that, that knowledge and that um, resources to really advocate for themselves, my, my experiences as a tenant really pale in comparison to those folks who, who make up the majority of New Orleans tenants, I think. And um, just, just running through some really common apartment issues, um, you have a lot of locks on doors that don't function, so the door to the house as well as doors within the house. And I mean, we, we can all imagine why that is a problem, that your house is not safe, anyone could access it. Um, particularly, this is a problem for families who are worried about um, domestic violence. They, they, they really are trying to protect themselves and their children from stalkers or people trying to enter the house. Um, there's a lot, uh, in, I would say most of the apartments that I've lived in and that I've heard of had roaches, rats, um, holes in the wall, a lot of leakage, a lot of bad roofs, and um, I just want to relay one tenant story real quick, I know my time is almost up, where um, the, apart, the whole apartment building which housed hundreds of people had, depending on the time of day, between uh, one and five inches of water on the floor at all times. And so you can imagine just even when the water wasn't there, the state that these apartments were in. And um, so I dealt with uh, numerous mothers and uh, tenants who, who not only in that apartment building, but in other apartment buildings with severe leaks and recurring black mold. But there, this one story in particular from that place, uh, there was a 19-year-old woman whose mother had passed recently, and she was raising her younger siblings, and she had been in an apartment that was experiencing that, that flooding pretty regularly. She said she had already moved out. She had already um, gotten her things out of there because the usual landlord response is, you know, avoidance, denial, uh, and then threats of eviction if you push too hard. I mean, and I can say that across the board of, of everyone that I've experienced has gone through those stages of landlord responses. Um, and I think other people have said that. But she said, you know, I already moved my siblings out of that place, um, and I don't want a lot of money or anything, but... Uh, the only items belonging to my mother that I had after she passed were in a box in that closet that got flooded and ruined. And she said, I, I, just, I just don't think it's right. I just don't think they should be able to do this to us. And I said, I, you know, being an intern at the time, I had no idea what the fate of her matter would be. But I told her, no matter what happens, you keep fighting because you're right. And it's going to be hard, and people are going to tell you no, and it's going to be really hard to get your rights. But you, you are right. They, don't, they shouldn't have the right to do that to you. You should keep fighting. And I hope that with all these great minds in the room, we can come to solutions so that people like her won't have to. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Rose. Mm -hmm. Quinn Griffin, followed by Brion de Decker. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Fine, thank you. Thank you to the committee for hearing testimony on this important issue. My name is Quintrell Griffin, and I am the intake coordinator at the Greater New Orleans Fair Housing Action Center. I'm one of the first people that our clients get to talk to to tell their story. And um, unfortunately, we get a lot of calls on dangerous conditions from renters every week. One story in particular had to do with um, a mother and a grandmother, Miss Carol, whom I'm only going to say her first name because, like you said, um, tenants are fearful of eviction or retaliation. 
Miss Carol moved into an apartment in New Orleans East in December, her with her daughter and her grandchildren, ages eight, six, and two. Shortly after moving in, she noticed that when it rained, carpet got soaked and um, it caused mold on the windows. Uh, there were other internal leaks, which included um, the toilet seeps under water, seeped under the toilet, soaking up the closet, which caused all of the kids' clothes to get dirty, um, resulting in them having to throw the, the clothes away. The most concerning issue was a leak in the kitchen ceiling. It started small with little dips onto the floor. Miss Carroll reported it to her landlord, along with other mold issues. The only result she got was that the landlord sent someone over to paint over the mold. Um, within a few weeks, the small leak grew bigger, and um, it resulted into a big tear and then a hole. She again called the landlord, but no repairs were made. Later that week, a large chunk of the kitchen ceiling caved in. Thankfully, no one was injured. Unfortunately, the landlord fixed uh, the hole with tape. In the meantime, the family was still suffering from respiratory problems from the mold as well as the dampness. Ms. Carroll was unwilling to pay her rent until the problems were finally taken care of, and her landlord, her landlord responded, issuing her a notice to vacate. Ms. Carroll is just one of many tenants at this property who has these issues, and it's common practice from the landlord to threaten tenants with notices and fines to keep them quiet. We've also found that when we work with tenants and call 311 on their behalf, operators tell us that they don't accept complaints about landlords not making repairs and that people should get legal aid instead. The good news is that Ms. Carroll and her family were able to find a new place in much better conditions, but the reality is that most tenants usually move into other apartments with similar conditions. Ms. Carroll couldn't be here today, but I know if she was, she would um, request that renters, have to, renters didn't have to go through this. All mothers, families, and New Orleanians deserve a healthy home. Amen. Thank you so much. Rion, the Deckers coming up. Keith Twitchell will be next, followed by Hardell Ward. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Brianda Decker. I'm here representing Jane Place Neighborhood Sustain Sustainability Initiative, which is a community land trust that develops permanently affordable rental housing in New Orleans. But I also came here today to talk about my personal story of terrible housing conditions in New Orleans. Four years ago, after completing my graduate studies, I returned to New Orleans with less than $500 in my checking account, and I ended up with uh, living in a substandard rental in the seventh ward. The unit did not have a working stove, and my landlord told me that I was going to have to pay him extra rent in order to get it repaired. Um, the electrical wiring shorted out, and half of the apartment had no electricity for two weeks. We had to run electric, like, extension cords everywhere to get power into different rooms. The hot water heater broke, and we did not have hot water for two months. Luckily, it was July, and without the air conditioning units running because the electricity wasn't working, I could take cold showers, so that was nice, but also... A uh, really terrible situation. I ended up paying out of pocket to get the electrical system repaired, at which point the landlord then rented out the back shed, which was uninhabitable, to a man for him to run a snowball stand out of. He ran um, uh, extension cords from our house to the, to the um, back unit and then ran a garden hose from the outside taps to actually make the snowballs with. And after sort of complaining about that and complaining about the unsanitary food preparation that was going on in the unit, I started withholding rent um, because I'd already been paying out of pocket for repairs, at which point I got a five-day notice to vacate the apartment. I called 311, who told me to call the civil court. I called the court, and their response to me was, well, there's nothing that we can do, but there's no way they're going to get to you in five days. You probably have at least two weeks to find a new apartment. Now, luckily, at that point, I had saved up enough money from my white-collar nonprofit job to afford a better apartment, but there was a family below me who had a five-year-old daughter. Um, they both worked in the service industry, and they were not so lucky. After being removed from the Bell Street house, they ended up in another substandard rental in the Upper Ninth Ward. This unit only had plexiglass on the windows. After it was broken into and robbed, they ended up having to leave the city. This is the reality faced by thousands of working families in our city. It's this terrible trade-off between habitability, affordability, and safety. 
the fact that my slumlords, like my previous landlord, who had a unit burned down in the Treme a couple of years ago due to faulty wiring, can operate with impunity in the city is deeply troubling. Renters need access to safe, affordable, healthy homes, and they do not have the ability to change this imbalance of, of, of power alone due to fear of retaliation from landlords and the dearth of affordable, safe, healthy housing in this city. I know the council has taken particular interest in how best to improve the daily lives of renters in the city, and I thank you for that and ask that you continue your work to find a solution. Thank you so much. You. I, I visited a home just yesterday. It looked like a spider web with all those uh, extension cords. Unbelievable. Keith Twitchell followed by Hardell Ward, and our final uh, speaker, Ethan Ellistad. Good afternoon, Mr. Twitchell. Good afternoon, Council. I'm Keith Twitchell with the Committee for a Better New Orleans, and I certainly want to thank you all for taking leadership on this issue. We know that living in New Orleans is getting um, more and more expensive, but many renters are paying ever higher prices while still living in the same unsafe homes. And there's ample data to show that New Orleans housing stock is rife with health issues, safety issues, leaks, mold, rodents, and fire, among many other things. Many organizations like ours who care about this issue have been collecting stories from people who live in these substandard conditions. And I'd like to share one from George, his girlfriend, and their newborn in New Orleans East. We had a strong gas smell whenever we turned on the heat. And the landlord said, we should open the door. He picks up the refrigerators and stoves from his apartments from off the streets. Only one pilot works on our stove. He says, that's fine. It's working fine. We have rat holes. There were snakes in someone else's apartment. People a couple of doors down have mushrooms growing in their house. The lady in the corner apartment died, and they said she had carbon monoxide in her system. The landlord complained, saying, she cost me $35,000. A lady died, and you're complaining about money? Another lady moved in there, and she was always sick. Her baby was always sick, too. We pay $650 a month, and look how we're living. Nothing has been replaced since Katrina. You ask the landlord to fix something, and it takes him four months. You, ask him to have, you tell him you have rent, he says he'll be here in five minutes. George's points are unassailable. Why should anybody be forced to live in a house with health and safety hazards? We know from other presenters that a safe and healthy, unhealthy home doesn't just make you sick, it creates chaos in your life, it can lead to mental health symptoms as well as health symptoms for children, families, and this is why I'm so grateful to the council for taking on this systemic type of issue. We urge the city to ensure, especially around Mother's Day, that all mothers and children have a safe and healthy home. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Hardell Ward. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Hardell Ward, and I'm a staff attorney with Southeast Louisiana Legal Services, otherwise known, used to be known as New Orleans Legal Aid. I work in the housing unit. I'm here today just to share a few stories from some of our clients who had to deal with this issue. First is Mrs. L. Mrs. L is a single, two, is a single mom of two young children. Her youngest was born premature and has a heart condition that, and other cardiac issues that are affected by the environment. She has an elevated, an elevated heart rate is dangerous for her, and she must avoid being frightened or alarmed or risk infection or other problems. Her unit was infested with rats. Uh, the landlord would not respond to Mrs. L's complaints, and she eventually had to contact legal aid to attempt to seek a resolution. She didn't need us to get the place fixed, but she needed us to break her lease because they would not let her leave the unit. Then there's Mrs. Mrs. D. Mrs. D was a single mom of two kids. Both have asthma and use a plug-in asthma machine, which she didn't have any, no federal subsidy, no subsidy. Her landlord agreed to pay the utilities. Her landlord allowed her energy to be cut off and would not take the steps to get her electricity turned back on. She had to contact our office in order to get, to put pressure on the landlord to put the utilities back on, utility that she was paying for in her rent so that her children can breathe. Then there's Mrs. O. She was a single mom of three kids. She's disabled and her two children. Because she's on a fixed income, income, she is forced to live in multiple homes with substandard conditions. Recently, she lived in a property with exposed electrical wires in her children's bedroom and visible mold and mildew throughout their property. Her landlord refused to make repairs, and she, and she, and she risked child protective services being called for, for the nature of her kids' unit. Finally, Mrs. M., 
Mrs. M is a single mom with two children, no subsidy again. She lives in an apartment, in, in apartment complex in New Orleans East. There was a leak in her ceiling that caused mold and mildew that was aggregating her child's respiratory issues. Every time it rained, it would leak in her apartment. Her carpet was wet all the time. The landlord refused to make repairs until our office was able to step in and, and with a demand letter and to enforce her housing rights. Many of these clients, all, these are clients who all paid market rent for their units, mm -hmm. who all paid their deposit, and had to seek legal aid for basic housing, housing rights. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Ward, just for the record and the viewing uh, audience as well, can you give information, contact information to your organization? I know it was formerly known as Legal Aid, and uh, you all have done tremendous work for residents throughout the city of New Orleans. I know it firsthand, but give some information so that folks know how to contact you. Thank you very much. Uh, Southeast Louisiana Legal Services, we're located at 1010 Common Street, uh, Suite 1400A. Our phone number is 504-529-1000. Uh, you can reach the housing unit specifically with extension 223, but we also do other cases, not, not simply housing. Personally, I'm at the Housing Authority of New Orleans every other Thursday for an outreach. I won't be there this Thursday, May 12th, but I will be there in the next week where I do an outreach from 1.30 to 3.30, but I'm generally there to 4.30 mm -hmm. because of need. So you can walk in and meet me there. You can contact our secretary unit. You can also walk into our offices any day. We do intake specifically Mondays, Wednesday, and Friday. However, a client who comes into our office will be seen and if there's an immediate problem, we do the intake process that day. We only delay it because lack of resources. We just don't have the time to process everyone for our services. Now, if the council was to organize uh, an outreach component for residents to come show up and report um, you know, directly, would that be something that you would partner with us on? Or I go anywhere okay. I'm asked okay. at any time. Uh, if you give me a time and a place and a table and Very good. <laughs> doesn't need to be shade. I've done outreach in front of my car at River Gardens Project. Yeah. It does not matter where. If you give me a time, if people are going to, if you can tell me people will be there or if you think someone mm -hmm. will show up, I, I will go there and sit there. I'll give you an hour or two. I can do that. Good. But I, you know, it, but we're there. Just get, you give us a time and place, we will be there. I will personally be there. Thank you so you much. I just think I'm just off the cuff. That could be a good next step in terms of this body doing better outreach in the community to get these not only the stories but to start getting enforcement where it's supposed to be slss slls exists to serve we also do another outreach at daughters of charity hospital through another attorney who does primary habitability issues that's every monday i believe at two uh, that attorney is Hannah Adams, who's away in training right now. But if you contact me, I can, we can give you these. Yeah, we'll connect we with you, and then you'll connect us to additional partners that can, be, that can participate. Yes, ma'am. Thanks so Thank much, ma'am. Mr. Ethan Ellistad, and you can get me straight. And Ethan, I should know better. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Um, I'm Ethan Ellistad. I'm the director of the Music and Culture Coalition of New Orleans. And we really wanted to be here today to sort of be in solidarity of this issue. But, you know, I come here and speak a lot about noise ordinances and music venues and zoning, but we're also really cognizant of the fact that we could solve all those issues tomorrow, but without solving the affordability crisis in the city, then all, essentially all our other work becomes moot. Because if musicians and culture bearers can't afford to live here, then it doesn't matter how many music venues we have because there won't actually be anyone to perform in them. Um, you know, this is an issue we're certainly engaging in more um, you know, we had a meeting last month specifically about housing, but that was essentially our first foray into the issue. We're going to continue to to work on it um, because this is an issue that is certainly growing, and we hear a lot of stories about people that have substandard housing, but they don't necessarily want to get up and speak about it because they put themselves on the line and then could lose their situation. Um, and I also, you know, I know there's been a lot of talk about Airbnb, and people come up and speak repeatedly and passionately about it, but I also know that you know, if we solve the Airbnb issue tomorrow, we still would have an affordability crisis in the city. And so I also want to put a challenge out there to people that come and speak on that to also get engaged in this issue. I would love to see the numbers and the passion that are people speaking on that to come here and speak on you know, basic, safe, affordable housing for everyone in the city. So thank you all, and we'll talk again soon. Absolutely, and thank you so much. And these coalitions are very important. Uh, we are also working to establish one amongst our educators. I had a dinner meeting with a group of about 15 educators in the city because they do care 
very deeply about this issue and they interface with the families and children on a daily basis and I'm letting them know that their voice is needed as we discuss uh, next steps that the city council can take uh, to address this issue. Um, before I turn it over to my colleagues uh, who I know would uh, want to um, give comments as it relates to our panelists um, and we have Councilman Brosset who's also joined us uh, this afternoon. I just wanted to ask a couple of, of, of questions. Now, um, Ms. Um, Ms. Della, as well as, as, as Dr. Holder, now you mentioned, um, you gave statistics, you gave a number of 2,000 units that did not have functioning. I believe it was fire detectors. Uh, you gave other little, um, you gave numbers. Is there a way uh, that we can get a list of those properties that make up that number? Because if you know um, of these properties, then it seems like we should also, in order to ensure compliance and enforcement from code enforcement as well as safety and permits where uh, necessary. Do you have that data? I don't. It's from the, the data that I shared is from the American Housing Survey. I'm okay. not sure that it's available um, in an identifiable way for units specifically. We can certainly look into that, but I don't think that they aggregate the data in that way. Well, I would definitely want to look closer at it and take a deeper dive. Because if you're telling, if you're telling us that there are X amount of properties that exist in New Orleans, to me, I think you should be able to provide where those properties are instead of just throwing a number out there. This is so important that facts matter and um, we don't want to go after their clearly good actors, right? Not all landlords are bad. We have good ones. And that's my little shout out to our home builders association and our rental uh, property owner groups over there. Thank you for being here. And they are partners uh, in the discussions with the council as we figure out together the best way to address uh, properties that do not meet the minimum housing standards and who are deemed really slum properties. And I know that one uh, solution or tool that we're uh, thinking of creating legislation around is the rental housing registry. Um, and so we're, uh, again, talking and working with partners to determine how that will work and what that looks like. But based on testaments made uh, today, there is a need for us to take real action and swift action as it relates to uh, these properties that are non-quality. Uh, so with that, um, Council Member Williams, any, anyone want to? Oh, uh-oh, my, my friend coming. Come on in. Come on up. And he'll be able to introduce himself because he's going to get to the mic before I get the card but he represents our Home Builders Association, doing a great job in the region. Thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, Chairman Cantrell. Uh, and as you alluded to, uh, we've spent a lot of time together here in the last uh, several months discussing not, not just this issue, but, but a lot more broadly what, what housing does or should or could look like in the city of New Orleans. Um, we, we came, thank you. Uh, we came just for some intake and just to listen, uh, frankly, and, uh, you know, Frankly, there's there's no distance between uh, my colleagues and I and what we heard today. Those conditions, as such, are deplorable. Um, you know, it, but to to get to the root of it, to to, to start with some resolution, we yeah, we're clearly going to need more information. Um, we don't know who the owners of these units are, particularly whether they're affiliated with our organizations or not. Uh, we certainly have lots of suggestions as to to how we could start to mitigate a lot of these effects uh, by far. Uh, ironically, um, one thing I never heard today in any of the testimony, which I think is paramount, I didn't hear anything about code enforcement. And, you know, that is a, a seminal way to, to obviously get our properties in better line. Again, it's not the panacea. I understand they're, they're overwhelmed and probably understaffed, but I didn't hear that utterance at all. Um, and, and I'm sure folks have gone and reported things to code enforcement and, 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 and maybe didn't get the satisfaction that, that they hoped for, but at the same time, th they've got to be an integral player in this. And if, if there's uh, resources that need to be addressed as such, great. Uh, so so that's, that's, that's kind of a jump off point. Mm -hmm. 
from where we're at. But again, uh, you know, we've been working. The lines of communication are open, and if there's something we can do uh, to help uh, beyond just this issue, uh, you, you know, we. Uh, we're there. So yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. And as you said, uh, for being here, and as I promised you, uh, you and other partners will never be blindsided about what this body is working on as it relates to the rental registry or this issue across the board. Right. So having you at the table is the best place for you to be in order for us to get the best outcome. Now, as it relates to code enforcement, you may not have, have heard it from that side, but you have heard it from this side. Mm -hmm. But what I heard for, sh for certain is that there's not a real mechanism, one that is communicated effectively to the public as to how they contact government contact code enforcement to then report the problem and get enforcement and get it resolved. When they call 311, we're not really accepting um, um, information on occupied properties, particularly rental housing you know, issues. And that came out uh, over and over again. That's what I heard. And that's where we need to, meaning the council, need to get more engaged and involved in shaping up on the administrative side on how we can meet the needs of our people um, going forward relating to code enforcement. Right. And I've said over and over, we, we, we have not done code enforcement well, enforcement period. And this is a place that we can truly start. And it's also a way that it can pay for itself. If we're doing our job and we're finding the bad actors and that should you know go back into the bucket to help us enforce as well as improve the quality of life of people and we have a housing trust fund that's already in place uh the nif we just need to ensure that resources and fees and fines get funneled into that housing trust fund to then improve people's housing um stock, improve the housing stock in the city. Sure, sure, agreed. And uh, I think uh, get, kicking it off, again, that, that data, if it is 2,000 houses if, or, or units, if it's 7,000, you need to be able to examine that. Yeah, and hand. that's going to be our job, and we're yeah. going to get that no, data, and that will be the first steps in which we really start to focus on. And that can happen before rental registry, in my opinion. Sure. So thank sure. you. Thank you. Um, colleagues? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairwoman Cantrell. Um, the lion's share of um, New Orleanians rent. I mean, it's been that way for a very, very long time. Uh, very similar to uh, the population in New York, largest, uh, large group of renters. The difference is the socioeconomic status of the renters, which means that uh, the poverty issue that we have in our city. Uh, manifests itself in a situation where we have people who are working hard, sometimes more than one job, only to live in inhumane conditions. And, you know, I understand, uh, and I, I do appreciate having folks from uh, the landlord side of, the, of, of, of this issue, but if we were here talking about child abuse, you would not have, uh, you're not going to have uh, an issue from good parents. Right. This is an issue uh, for folks who want to get paid a fair market rent, but deliver a substandard product. Um, and, you know, when we talk about crime or someone gets hurt, we get a, we get a packed house. We get every chair filled up. We get every every media outlet here. And everybody wants to talk about the 60 seconds uh, of which a poor decision was made to cause violence against another person. But nobody talks about the 21 years or 17 years that this individual lived in inhumane conditions, looking through the floor, seeing the ground, seeing the dirt, um, not having proper drainage, uh, having water coming in through the roof day in, day out. You can't learn uh, at school when you can't sleep at night in your home. And so these are issues that should affect everyone, whether you're renting, whether you own your home or not, because we're talking about the lion's share of our community. I, I want to thank uh, Councilwoman Cantrell for, for giving voice to the voiceless, because you can't call code enforcement. 
uh, and you don't want to call code, code enforcement if it means your landlord is going to just kick you out. So the idea that you have control over this situation, that you can, you have a voice, you have an actionable uh, way to, to get, uh, to redress your issues, it just doesn't exist right now. And I'm, I'm thankful that we have a council that is, that is willing and working to try to put together mechanisms and tools for people to pull themselves out of the situation, not just for them, but for all of us, so that we have a community that does not have crime spiking, so that we have a community where people have a decent quality of life. You know, and it'd be one thing if somebody was charging $20 for these places, but they're charging fair market rent, and they're not delivering on, on, on what they're supposed to deliver on. So uh, this council is engaged. We want to make sure as we work through this process and come up with the solutions that our solutions don't hurt the people we're trying to protect the most. Right. And it's a very difficult process because we don't want to get anybody put out because being homeless is, is worse than being in an unfit, unhealthy, and unsafe home. Um, but this affects us all, and to the extent that we can get everybody to buy in on that, we have to. Uh, I, Wes, thank you for always being a champion on this. Ms. Lackey, thank you for your presentation. Doctor, thank you. Um, I'm glad we do have some of our media friends here today uh, because this quality of life issue is the precursor to the crime talk yep. that leads the news yep. every night. That's right. Thank you, Council Chair. Thank you so much, Councilman. A great point, always right on. And um, I, did, I didn't say that we have um, uh, the parents of a young man who fell through the floor couple weeks ago due to termite damage that was reported to the landlord. Nothing was done. And as a result, he fell through. And so these things need to be avoided. And um, you do have a council not only that's listening, but is willing to take some action in the push for enforcement. Um, any other council members? Council member Brossat? Uh, thank you, Councilwoman and Chair uh, Cantrell. Just to echo with um, Councilman Cantrell, William said, uh, you know, everybody in this city, all citizens deserve a quality standard of living. Uh, and for too long, uh, it's going unnoticed. And we have to come together, as is our stakeholders are here, and make sure that um, the bad actors are dealt with appropriately and as was said earlier there are a lot of good landlords out there but a child falling through the floor and a landlord not responding in a positive appropriate manner is inexcusable uh, we are all human beings and we should be treated uh, fairly and properly and so um, I look forward to continue to work with all the stakeholders, my council colleagues, because you do, you do see a council up here that's ready to uh, respond and put the appropriate mechanisms in place uh, where um, things are falling through the cracks. That's what government is supposed to do. And um, I thank you all for attending today. Very uh, important topic, uh, along with affordability along with discrimination with short-term rentals and rentals period and so uh, a subject that I care really deeply about and uh, we'll continue to work together on it thank you thank you council member Gidry thank you um, I you know of course I, I join in with uh, what the other council members have said uh, it's absolutely despicable that people are making money off of the suffering of other residents of our city. It's just despicable. Um, and I, I know that several years ago, um, uh, Council Member Stacy had undertook making some changes to code enforcement, and we tried to tackle that issue of habitable dwellings. And it's very difficult because um, with the limited resources the city has, the the landlords 
give us the same runaround that they give to the renters and uh, not show up or, you know, you've got to be able to have permission to get entry. There's all kinds of very difficult um, uh, reasons, very difficult problems that occur that make it hard for uh, government to put the kind of resources they need to make this work. But it's also very necessary. So um, I know that we need to be looking at that again. We're looking at affordability. We need to be looking at uh, how we can hold these landlords uh, um, uh, you know, for their, responsible for their, um, really, what's criminal abuse of other people. So thank you for bringing this before us again. Thank you, Councilmember Cantrell. Thank you. So before we adjourn, adjourn the meeting, are there comments that you, further comments that you would like to share? Not? And Ms. Trina, I wanted to ask you, um, if you would, to share with the public on the organizations that helped you get out of your previous situation and into home ownership. I think it would be a good, you know, nice plug for those organizations because we really do have boots on the ground, you know, working on this uh, every day, uh, meaning these organizations. Well, being an employee at the VA, mm -hmm. my husband, he reported to his social worker, and then she brought us to FHA okay. on Jeff Davis, and they helped us from there. And, and that's the Fair Housing Action Center located on Jeff Davis, the Greater New Orleans Fair Housing Action Center. The director is here with us, and, and members of the organization are present uh, this afternoon Thank you for sharing that. Because people need to know that the resources are real. Yeah. And, and that organizations, these, these folks who are leading these organizations are really getting results. Okay, so thank you for that. You're welcome. Okay, and so uh, if there are no further comments, I would ask for adjournment. But just be rest, assur you know, rest assured that this council is focused on this and we're going to be cleaning up these neighborhoods, and you can't do that without not starting with housing. So thank you. Thank you. Motion to adjourn? Second. All right, got a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. Meeting adjourned. Thank you all oh, so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, baby. Nobody but God. Thank you so much.